Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is uh, number two in this study dealing with the lines simply presented. Hopefully, we can live up to that uh, billing. Uh, but before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we are thankful for the light that has come to us from your word, the light of the midnight cry that has been shining all along the path, giving light for our feet. And Lord, we know that there is much that we still need to understand. We know as we go through these things um, simply, it does not mean that they will not be uh, deep and that insights um, will help us um, to understand these things, to pull them together and to be able to present them to others. So we ask for your Holy Spirit, Spirit to enlighten our minds and um, that we can see clearly what it is that you have been trying to show us. Thank you for hearing our prayer and be with each person. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon again. So where we finished off with this study uh, last Sunday on uh, Christmas today, today is New Year's. Happy New Year, uh, at least on the, the papal Gregorian calendar. Um, it's going to come 13 days from now on the, uh, the pagan Julian calendar, pagan Rome. And, um, but anyway, we, we have all these different types of calendars, which are pretty interesting. Now, what we're going to look at is um, a very simple look at Millerite history. Now, there is lots um, that we've come to understand over, well, ever since Jeff began studying the repeat of Millerite history. And so we're going to go over some of the things that we, we had covered in understanding the lines back a year ago when we started looking at uh, these lines in a lot more depth uh, than, we, um, than we had previously. But just because we're, we're going to be going over some of those things doesn't mean there isn't going to be things that, we're, that we haven't really noticed um, and that in our retrospective view of things over what's happened in the past year that we will have a bit more light. So this is not um, going to go through everything, obviously, that we went through in understanding the lines. Um, there's lots of different things that we covered. But what we finished off with last Sunday was um, Revelation chapter 14. And we know that the three angels' messages were um, first seen by this movement, um, uh, the repeat of Millerite history. So we knew about the three angels' messages in Millerite history, um, but this movement first started to recognize that this was a template that we could examine to compare every great reformatory movement. And so we're, we're going to go to the whiteboard here. I can hardly wait till I get my new whiteboard. Because it will be a little bit better. And it has been set up a bit differently. And... Before we get to the whiteboard, I just want to read over these verses again. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying, with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, 
And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. <clears throat> So the, the scope of these verses is a lot broader than the Millerites understood them to be. And I'm going to just go here to this whiteboard. This, and I'm going to get a few things going here. So here we have this three-step prophetic Still sharing. testing. Yeah, I've got to change that here. Just hang on. I noticed that looking at it. There we go. And we know that this, this idea of this three-step testing prophetic message is this message that was given in Millerite history. It's conviction of sin, confession, and repentance. And I'm going to try to explain this all again just so we can. Because I'm doing these presentations for some non-Adventists. Um, not in recording them, but I've been uh, doing these presentations. Um, dealing with the first reform line, which is creation, and showing how the Christian experience, that is, we know that this is the everlasting gospel. <clears throat> and, and this is really the, the foundation of Adventism. I mean, obviously, the 2300 days in connection with the sam sanctuaries, the foundation and central pillar of Adventism. So, you know, we often just talk about uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 14 as that scripture. But we know that our message is this everlasting gospel. And we understand this as a three step testing prophetic message. So we know that there's three steps which we we had drawn there and we know that we can we can see them as justification sanctification and glorification and that all of those are tied up in the first angel's message itself and we know that there's this darkness and for the individual that darkness is the darkness of sin and if we're a Christian, all of us has, have experienced that darkness and have responded to the light that has come to us. Now, many people do respond to this light, but it doesn't mean that they're going to continue on that course. Not everyone's going to continue to respond to light. Some people receive light for time, but whatever reason, I don't know if there's a reason for it per se, but they choose not to continue to, to, they choose to not continue in the light. They choose darkness rather than light. They don't want their deeds to be exposed. And of course that's counterproductive. Now we know we, we had talked about um, that we're, what we're doing is we're putting on a line 
in an orderly fashion, the events we're setting in order upon a line, a measuring line, which is a line of judgment. And when we look at Isaiah chapter 28, and it talks about precept upon precept, line upon line, later in that chapter, it's going to talk about judgment will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. So each one of these way marks is righteousness. Oops, yeah, that's right. Right? Each one of these is righteousness. But what does that mean? What does it mean that a way mark is righteousness? So this is all judgment. Right? So we've got this judgment that is this line. So, I mean, if we put this as 1798, why is this righteousness? What What's happening in 1798? It's an end of time. Uh, it's the end of a prophecy. Okay. That's true. It's the time of the end. Which is also true. That's also true. But it doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't tell me why it's righteousness. Okay, think about this. Here's darkness. Unrighteousness. So what is this? That's the light. Okay, so the this righteousness. Is, so righteousness is truth, right? Yes. It's, it's being a, revealed. Truth is being revealed, right? It's a revelation, right? Yeah. Okay. So that means that darkness continues all along this line, right? Yes. Okay. So, you know, we always do this. We go, there's an increase of light. Or sometimes we call it an increase of knowledge. So we go, increase of knowledge, right? Or increase of light different ways that we've re represented that. So we have this light, the path of the just or the righteous is as a shining light that shineth more and more into a perfect day. Um, so one thing we know in our personal life, when this light first comes to us, I mean, it's going to be manifest in a, an experience that we call justification, Right. Right. First okay. step. Yeah. So that first step, this first angel's message um, is the message of fear God. Right. And we, we, we say that it's manifest in, in this way that we have conviction of sin and confession and repentance. This three step uh, message that we experience in justification. You know, God doesn't just justify us out of nowhere. We're in darkness. He gives a message to us. We respond to that light, either by going towards that light and accepting it and having this work of justification occur in our lives, or we, we hide from that light. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But this is a revelation of, of the character of Christ because all truth, all light, all righteousness comes from Christ. And so <clears throat> this way mark, these way marks that occur in these lines, they're revelations. Right? Light is coming to us. Now, we first understand these in the context of Revelation chapter 14. Right? So that's where Adventism uh gets its understanding of Revelation 14 is in Millerite history. That's where it occurs. Um, I don't know prior to Millerite history 
really how this three angels message was understood by all the different people in the world. Um, Because there was lots of different ideas about the book of Revelation. But William Miller understood that these three angels messages applied to the time they were in. Now, they, they tended to focus upon the first angel's message. Miller did, right? I mean, in Miller, yes. I think, did, did yes. we find them, them marking where the second angel arrives and the third angel arrives, you know, early on? They, we, don't, we don't really see that, do we? No, we see it later. Right. So all, all that he knows, and, it, and it's kind of interesting to me that, you know, there's many things that Miller just doesn't really address, but as he doesn't understand them and God doesn't particularly give light to him on them. And, and yet, you know, if you, if you look at the Miller, Millerite history, they're going to understand. And, and Stephen did a presentation, which he, you know, he could have done in a few presentations instead of one, but the first part of it, really relates to this because we know it's the parable of the 10 virgins, right? Um, that is how they came to understand this. And Ellen White uh, had an understanding of this after 1844, uh, dealing with, you know, the going forth of the virgins and the tearing time and these things. But prior to that, they didn't really know what these things meant. They could read a verse, but not see it. They could make charts, you know, the, the 1843 chart, 300 of them. They could make those charts and, and, and yet, and they would know that they're doing this according to Habakkuk chapter two, verse one to four, but they don't see the tarrying time that's in the chart, right? Only after do they understand how to apply that to the chart. And the first one that does that is snow. He's the first one who sees this um, so that he can make this application of that Ellen White later basically uh, quotes when she describes uh, the fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, verse 1 to 4. Now, in order to present this, because right now I'm I'm looking at the people who are watching this, but I I can't see that the people who are going to watch this on video later on. But if I want to teach this to someone, I mean, how would we typically teach Millerite history? And and when I say typically, I'm talking about Adventists. You know, what do we do with Millerite history? You mean as a whole? Yeah, just as a whole. How do we understand? We shelve it. No, but we we do present it. I mean, at least you know we used to because we talk yeah, about. Yeah, but we message. don't really go into any great depths. Okay. Yeah. We so, we tell about the the seventeen ninety eight. We tell about the uh, the um, Lynch's the prophecy. Okay, well, I don't think we would talk about witches' prophecy too much, but if we do, it will just be this impetus for for the message, right? Right. And, and in some ways, you know, we we don't really understand. They don't it. talk. They don't talk about it publicly too much. No. Yeah. So they don't really understand it in the sense of an arrival of a message, a formalization, an empowerment, or anything. They just know the message was empowered. The message of William Miller was empowered, and and they're gonna. They're going to take some of the words of Ellen White and they're going to look at Exeter. So, so if you're going to look at Adventist history and you're going to look at Millerite, like or Millerites from the Adventist perspective, I mean, just a simple line is you'll have, we're going to know 1798 is the time in the end, right? And then we know that Miller's going to get this message and that that's going to be in 1818. So if this this is you know pretty detailed for an Adventist presentation, but you know if somebody who was into Millerite history was going to present this, he would talk about you know Miller had this 1818, and you know they might even talk about 1831 when Miller first presented the message. 
And then they're going to talk, if they believe in it, August 11th, 1840, right? And, they, and they're going to know about Exeter. Right? So they're going to know about Exeter, Samuel Snow on the horse, even though it's not an Exeter. Right? So, so Stephen presented some of these ideas um, in, in presenting Millerite history. But in some ways, you know, this is a lot for an Adventist to take in. And, and one is they don't really have the context that we have. I mean, I didn't. So I read the Great Controversy, and you're going to hear about this in the Great Controversy. This is how Ellen White sort of lays it out, correct? She doesn't talk about Exeter, though. She just talks yeah, about Yeah, but she just doesn't lay it out on a line like we do. Yeah, she doesn't. But, but you know, she's going to still tell the story. She's going to talk about midway. Yeah, she she has a, a natural progression. Yeah, and, and you're going to have in here the disappointment. And so you're going to have uh, the first disappointment. And then you're going to have uh, the great disappointment. Right? You're going to know it's October 22, 1844. She will mention the fanaticism. Yeah, but most people aren't going to know that. So she's going to mention this. I'm just, but right. So she's going to mention the fanaticism. She's going to mention lots of details. But we, in a sense, because we weren't there, because we didn't experience this, for most Adventists, they're going to have a very sketchy idea of what this history is about. Now, we can see that in uh, the movie Tell It to the World. Um. We, we can kind of see how Adventists understand Millerite history. So the Adventist church made a, a movie. Um, I stopped watching it when we got to Exeter and there are just a few people standing in the woods there. You know, there isn't like 5,000 people or anything. Um, so it definitely gives a, in my view, a distorted well, yeah, people don't really, you don't get a sense of how powerful the movement was in that movie. That's the thing that I can't guess bothered me the most. Um, you just see a kind of a few people that are kind of acting fanatical, you know, from a worldly perspective, that's what they would see. Um, so they wouldn't really see the power of what this movement was. Um, and so in some ways it weakens uh, this history. But this Maybe is a history. Right, but maybe it's better than nothing because yeah. most people don't get anything. At least it's maybe <laughs> an introduction, even though there's mistakes in it, like the House Miller at the Exeter camp meeting and things like that. There, so yeah, there's going to be misconceptions, but it's, well, it's yeah. maybe given how we sort of um, for, for people who don't know anything, it's maybe like some an introduction, maybe into something of it. Yeah, maybe though. You know, I, it's it's what Adventists understand is basically my point. You know, if if you know if you look at the books that Adventists have written about Millerite history, it's basically a study in in a misunderstanding of a history, like just a very shallow understanding of that history. And so, what they put in the movie just illustrates the weakness of our understanding of Millerite history. It's not just the limitations of, of making a movie itself. It's just the scope of what happened in Millerite history. I mean, you think about how many people were Millerites and, and how, how just impactful Miller's message was um, in New England. It's just something that, you know, Adventists don't think about. I never thought about even though I read The Great Controversy and Ellen White's giving us this information, I had no way to really appreciate it. Because where we come to appreciate it is as we go through this experience, right? So that's all I'm saying about it. I'm not saying like the movie, the movie's bad. I'm just saying that um, the people need to know that this is an experience that they have to have. And so 
if we're going to present Millerite history, we need to present it as the everlasting gospel, correct? Yes. Okay. Because if we're just presenting it as this sort of sketchy, you know, if that's all that people know about it is, you know, there was this guy, William Miller, and he he came to, somehow they came to predict this, this date, October 22, 1844, and Jesus didn't come back. Um, and they don't understand that this is the everlasting gospel. This is the first, second, and third angels' messages to be given to the world. Um, then they really don't understand the message. Now, they need to understand this basic structure. Now, when Jeff was presenting this, the first time I heard Jeff's presentations on this was in the Oklahoma camp meeting in 2010. And now they had, um, they were using PowerPoint slides, uh, some of the pres presenters. And the one thing that they, they would often do is this take this uh, sin, righteousness, and judgment from uh, the Gospel of John, right? About the, the comforter. You should convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And I focused a bit on that uh, before in my other presentation. So, but if we look at this, each of these are righteous, righteousness. So if we put sin over here, uh, righteousness again. And judgment. Why is why is these way these way marks that are all righteousness? Why is sin here? Why is righteousness there? And why is judgment there? Whatever this verse is, I can't remember the verse where it is, but. <clears throat> Because if we think in the context of this darkness, when light first comes to us, that light is righteousness. But are we justified? No, it convicts us of sin. Okay, right. So this is the conviction of sin. Now, that means that when we get to the second way mark, we, we have the word righteousness there. But we could say that this is, is sanctification. Right. So as a, a person who has received light, I mean, there's repentance that's here. But we have to receive more light. Because if we don't repent, can we receive the light that comes here on this second way mark? No. Right. So so we can't. And. Now, could we teach somebody all about Millerite history, all the dates, and then not experience any of this? Yes. Okay. So we always talk about righteousness by faith as an experience. But that, that experience, where does it begin? I'm sorry. Say that again. We, we know righteousness by faith is an experience, but where does that experience begin? Um, at when you get the light. Right. So it starts here, right? So if we're, we're going to see that, if we're going to believe that righteousness by faith is the third angel's message only, right? That this isn't righteousness by faith. Only this one is. Are we, we, if we if you can't have, you got to have the first and second before you get the third. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you, you have to the it first would, yeah it would it wouldn't be it wouldn't be I mean you wouldn't if you can't if you don't repent at the two first two you don't repent at the last. Okay. Right. So so we have the third angel's message, which is righteousness by faith in verity. And we've come to understand that what this means is that righteousness now is worked 
is displayed in the life in a powerful way. That's what the third angel's message is about. Correct? Correct. Okay. So, but you can't just get there. Right? You can't, you can't skip, skip these first two steps and get there. That is, it's, it's a three-step testing prophetic message. And, and the process that we have to go through um, can be illustrated in lots of different ways. Uh, in God's word. But one of the ways we illustrate it is in these various reform lines, right? So when we're looking at a reform line, what are we looking at a reform line for? Um. Story of restoration. Okay, whose restoration? Ours. Our restoration. Are we not looking at our life that God is giving sure, light, sure. yeah, he's giving light from the past so that we can understand where we are in the present, that we can understand the present duty, right? Now, there's lots of different studies that were given. Joanne gave a study uh, where she talked about this. She used some Ellen White quotes. And, you know, we have this... Um, present duty i can't remember i think there was another phrase that was being used i can't think what it was um but in order to understand what it is we are to do how we are to act what steps we are to take both in our role as part of a church as part of a movement as part of the body of christ and also in our individual lives this this requires us to have this experience, right? We can't just we can't just move to the duty part of things if we're not converted. Right? So so this is, you know, and I keep thinking, how how do we teach this to people? But really, it's how do I understand it myself? I mean, how do I understand all of these things that have been given to us? Because we've, we've had so much light. And yet, are we further along than, than we were before? I mean, in some ways, it seems like, um, you know, we're farther away from the end of things than we were, than we thought we were. That is... As we pass through this experience, I, I always liken it to, you know, climbing a mountain or a trail where you can think you're further along than you are, especially when you see like a false summit. You think, oh, there's the summit up there. And you get up there and you realize, well, no, you're far away from the summit. That summit is way further on than you thought. And, you know, you almost give up in despair sometimes um, or you break down and cry. It's, uh, <laughs> I have never done that personally, but uh, no, seen, not once, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So we know in in this walk, in this experience, that God is bringing us through the work of salvation, and so we look at this prophetically. But this is really about a revelation of Christ, and each of these way marks are giving us light. Now, for somebody who's who's not as familiar with these things as we are, I mean, we could put this out in Millerite history, but part of what we learned in Millerite history is that we could take these waymarks, these events, and we could we could put them into this line. So we we have this increase of knowledge, right? Now, in that that increase of knowledge, you would take this as, you know, 1816 to 1818, right? That's going to be Miller studying for two years. Now, of course, this increase of light comes here with an event. That's the Pope being taken captive. Uh, um, but Miller's not going to understand it in 1798. I mean, he's still a, a deist. He does get his concordance, though. So he gets his crudens. I've tried to find out the date that this would be. 
you know, I don't know if it was given to him on his birthday. When's his birthday? It would be the 15th of February. Yeah, so February 15th, right? So whether that's when he gets this concordance or not, I don't know. But what happens on February 15th, 1798? That's... Um... We understand that was the Pope was taken captive on that date. Yeah, so the Pope's taking captive on that date. So I mean, if he got it as a birthday gift, you know, he would have got it on the very day the Pope was taken captive. But I don't know. I can't prove that. Um, I've tried to find because uh, I believe they still have his concordance, whether it's the original one or not. But you know, I thought, oh man, if you know, it had. To, you know, presentation date in the front cover. Yeah, presentation, date, you know. Yeah, that would be really nice, huh? Yeah, yeah, it would be nice. But I don't you know, think it's going to happen that way. But well, we don't know. Maybe we'll find that one day. <laughs> but anyway, he gets this concordance. Now, this increase of light, though, there still are events that are occurring, right? And and we also one of the things we found as we we went through and examined the light. Um, you know, tried to understand the lines is that we could have a reform line for Miller himself. That is, we could zoom into this way mark that's 1798 and, and we, could, we could put Miller's life here in a reform line so that he has a personal reform line. And, and we saw that because we could do that with Abraham. We could do that with Isaac. We could do that with Jacob. We could find that each one of these way marks is a reform line. And if you think about it, it has to be. Because all of these three steps that occur in this, in this history of Millerite history, uh, they are reform lines in and of themselves. And so if they're reform lines in and of themselves, then they're going to have the characteristics of a reform line. They're going to go through three steps. <clears throat> And then we know that um, once we get to the increase of knowledge, I mean, we generally take 1833, and we know that that's going to be, so this is the first angel arrives, and this is the first angel formalized. That is, he now is a, uh, ordained as a Baptist minister, and um, he's going to now be invited to various churches. I mean, he gets some of that bit before. But this is where we generally mark the formalization of the message. I mean, in 1831, he does his first presentation, invited by his nephew uh, to speak. But then we know that this message is empowered on August 11th, 1840. Right? And this becomes, of course, an extremely important uh, symbol that ties our history to Millerite history. Um, and also just these spans of time. That's all the symbols that are created by this. But, but this is what happens in Millerite history. And of course, we read this in the Great Controversy, though uh, modern scholarship tries to uh, downplay this, that Ellen White was just only stating what people understood um, for those that actually still try and pretend they believe in the spirit of prophecy. Uh, they try to reinterpret what she's saying. Uh, some who don't really believe in the spirit of prophecy just, well, I'll note, say she was wrong and she didn't know what she was talking about. And but they'll all try to argue against this date. But of course, they're not studying the Bible in the way that Miller understood it. So they're not really studying it line upon line. They're using the modern um, Protestant method of understanding. And then we know that the second angel is going to arrive. And in this movement, this is the part that actually took us the longest to figure out. Um, and now why would that be? Why did the second angel's message, why did we not understand this part of Millerite history? Uh, we know there's a disappointment, right? We know that there was Samuel Snow, and then there's going to be the great disappointment. But why did this take us a long time to work out? Why did this sanctification 
part of this line. Why did that, why was that not just something that readily came to this movement? Would it be because they was going to have to separate? Well, how about the idea that sanctification is the work of a lifetime? Uh, yeah. Okay. That right. I mean, in a sense, we, we have, there's a lot that has to be worked out. Now it is the separation from sin, right? In, in a much, a much different way than justification is. I mean, justification is God forgives us and, and our past is counted to us. You know, his righteousness is accounted to us for our past. We don't go back and change what we did. We, we still sinned in the past and we begin to walk with him. And then we come to this experience now where we call it sanctification. And that's that daily justification. This is separating sin from our lives step by step as we walk with Christ coming closer and closer to him. And in Millerite history, um, there is this, this other message, which we call the second angel's message, that isn't presented by Miller, right? Now, Miller thinks he's presenting the second angel's message, right? Because they're going to use the term called the midnight cries. They're going to take this from the parable of the ten virgins, which we're, we're going to get into. Uh, I just don't want to do that in this presentation. But they believe that they are giving this message and that Christ is going to return very soon. And that the cry that they're giving, the message that they're giving is, is the second angel's message. Right? But we know so that the first angel empowered here, that the second angel doesn't arrive until when? What has to happen for the second angel to arrive? You have the first um, disappointment. Time of an end. Okay. So Miller had a prediction, right? And he makes this prediction in, um, in 1818 right that in about 25 years time that this whole history of this world is going to wrap up the world's going to wrap up i can't remember his words right and so that's pointing to 1843 now in 1843 they believe miller's um miller's prophecy is coming to an end right even in 1842 in december of 1842 uh Miller comes to understand that his, so this is after the 1843 chart is made, right? So when we look at the 1843 chart, um, where is the, the mistake on the chart? Where was the hand? Where was the mistake that God's hand hit? Is it on the top of the chart, the bottom of the chart? Top is, of the chart. Okay. So, so why is the chart, this 1843? Right side. Okay, so this 1843 date down here, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, it is. Why? Uh, because it, it, it started at it, it, 1335, it ended at 1335, it ended in 1843. Right, so here he's actually marking out the 1335. And we can know that because right under pagan Rome here, can't move it close to towards not long enough. But you can see over here, you got 1335 and the 1290. The difference is 45, right? That's the difference between 508 and 538. And so when you go to 1798 and you add the 45, you're going to get 1843, right? And this is Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. And does that end in 1843? The thirteen thirty five does, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it it actually ends at the first disappointment. So at the end yeah. of Miller's prophecy, the thirteen thirty five is correct. So that means Miller comes to understand this. So when they made this chart in eighteen forty two, um, 
they believe that 1843 went from January 1st to um, January 1st, 1843 to December 31st, 1843. Right? Right. That's how they understood it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So they understood that. But when we look at the top of the chart, I'm not going to move the camera again. Um, we have a mistake that was hidden. And that has to do with the end of the 2300 days and the 2520, because those are not going to end at the end of Miller's prediction. Those are going to end October 22, 1844. So the 2300 days and the 2520 don't end at the first disappointment, they end at the, the great disappointment. The period of time between the, these two periods in an inclusive count is 187 days, right? So there's 187 days um, from Miller's prediction to uh, the correct end of the 23 days, 2300 days and the 25, 20 days. 25, 20 years, pardon me, right? So they're going to end October 22nd, 1844. Now, this is a lot of information here, but what I'm trying to, to illustrate here is that there is Miller. He only makes this, this prediction, right? Now, he, he does make a prediction about the 2300 days and the 25, 20 years, what is called the, the seven times of Leviticus 26. But it's going to be Samuel Snow who's going to present this other message. Now, Samuel Snow's message is going to be developed here. So Snow is, in this history, another message, a second message. But it doesn't arrive until Miller's pr prediction ends. Right? We, we can't say it arrived before. Now, we used to. We would say it arrived when they made the 1843 chart and the Protestants closed their doors. So that's going to be summer of 1842. Right? That's, that's when wouldn't, we first said it. Wouldn't that be when the first angel ended and the second arrived? 1842? So, no, nope, the second doesn't arrive in 1842. We used okay. to say that, right? Right. Because we didn't understand Millerite history. So, I mean, we didn't even have the correct dates for the disappointment. Uh, because those were moved over, right? The, and, you know, I'm not going to go into all that. But what we know is there's Miller's prediction ends. And then... The second angel arrives. Now, the second angel, of course, just like we have with the first angel, it arrives, but there is an increase of knowledge, right? Because in this line, darkness goes all the way through this line. But light also goes all the way through this line, right? There's this constant increase of light. But there still is darkness, Now, so when we get to this second angel's message, and, and we're going to, to look at these things in a lot more detail, um, but I, you know, I keep trying to present this simply, but you can see that there's a lot here, even in what we would call a simple presentation. Now, of course, some of us are very familiar with these things, but the basic idea is you have a message that is a message about salvation, but it's expressed in events that are going to occur that have to do with an increase of light. And that those that receive this light can then receive this light. So not everybody who professes to receive the light has actually received it. But these people who receive this light of the second angel, they have received the light of the first angel. Now, there could be people who say they believe the light of the sec of the first angel and receive the light of the second in, in a way 
but they haven't really. But there are people that are going to have an experience that, that is a real experience, but it doesn't mean because they accept, they, they go through this experience and they're maybe accepting the second angel. When they get to this experience, are they going to reject the light that they already received? That is, even though they received light all along this way, they've accepted the first angel, they've accepted the second angel. But when the third angel arrives, we're going to see that many people don't accept the third angel. So did they really accept the second angel? No. Not really. Okay. Now, maybe some did. But for uh, exigent circumstances, um, like William Miller himself, uh, he doesn't accept the third angel. But is he lost? Is he what? Is he no. lost? No, he's not. We know he's not, right? And there, and there could be other people in these situations. Because God judges the heart. But as a reform line itself, we know that if you're going to receive the third angel's message, you have to have received the second. Right. And if you reject the third angel, you, you haven't received the second. You might have partly received it at first, but you have to receive it in order to, to have the third angel's message. Now, if we look at justification and sanctification, are there people who accept justification? That is, yes. they go to God, they ask, they recognize they're a sinner, they confess their sins, and they begin, they repent, they change, they stop listening to the music they listen to, they stop eating the things they ate, they stop talking the way they talked, uh, they start thinking about different things, different things, uh, you know, uh, draw their attention, the things that they once loved, they now hate, right? They go through an experience of justification, they have peace with God, they have joy, right? They want to share this truth with others. But they can come along, and as the Christian life gets a bit more difficult, they can fall away, right? I've seen it happen many times. It's that seed that's put on the, on the I guess it's called the stony ground here, right? They, they sprout up at first, but they have no root in them, right? And when the sun comes out, they wither away. And so sadly, we see that in people's experiences. <clears throat> so that work of sanctification just never really happens in their life. Now, some people may seem to happen, like there are people who make a lot of changes, but they still love the world. And, and you know, we can see this in a lot of Christians' experience where, I mean, they go to church, but their conversation isn't, isn't really spiritual. I mean, they still talk about the world on Sabbath. If you're visiting them, you know, it's it's not going to be a conversation that you want to have, not just on the Sabbath, but maybe even any day. Right. There's just the things that interest them are different. So they may have responded at one point, but now this work of living a Christian life, they have all kinds of excuses of why you know we don't need to live that way why this isn't important why that's not important now some people of course can be very sanctimonious right i mean you can think based upon what they how they talk that they must be following god right they must be really righteous they must be very good people um but of course their character of how they act when people aren't looking or when they're dealing with their spouse or something like that, I mean, they can be very unchrist like And so this work of sanctification isn't really taking hold upon them. But we can see then that this final step, the three angels, the third angel's message, this is a demonstration of Christ's righteousness to the world under some of the most trying circumstances, right? And so this is the work of judgment, so when we look at this, and notice, I don't just say justifications here and sanctifications here. This is when they begin. It's this three step. So judgment. Are we in the time of the judgment since October 22, 1844? 
right? Yes. Now, this, this time of the judgment has another way mark in it. Um, well, it has other way marks it, because it's the arrival of the third angel, right? So, Brother the Theodore? Yeah. Do you have do you have your um screen on the on um bigger size? No. If you know what I mean. Okay, so yeah, my my screen is the full screen. When somebody talks, it goes to their their name. But yeah, it's the entire size of the screen. You can't go by what you're looking at on my your screen, what I have on my screen. You have to choose your own screen. So if you double click on mine, it will show that up all the time. It won't show you other things. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> so we have this work of judgment. Now, we're going to go through these lines in, in a lot more detail. But I just wanted to give you this overview of this line in the in the context of the Christian life. So if we have righteousness here, which is the third angel's message, this is a demonstration of Christ's righteousness worked out in the life. And, and, and you cannot have judgment, God's people in judgment, if they're not at this step. Right? Could we have judgment over here? Could we have the day of atonement begin here? Like, is God, when we first get no. light, is God going to no. judge us right here and say, you know, him that is righteous, let him be righteous still? No. He's not going to do that. Is Again. He? Yeah. So he can't do that because God is, um, his dealings with men are ever the same. He is doing a work of salvation. He is bringing us, he's the author and finisher of our faith. He's bringing us through an experience so that we can stand there. Right? We need to cooperate with him. We need to follow him. We need to follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. We need to follow him in the work of the sanctuary, the work that he's doing on our behalf. And so we can see that as Seventh-day Adventists, we tend to focus on October 22nd, 1844 and after. Right. We, we mention this and we, we give some lip service to it, but we want to talk about and this is what I did from pretty much ever since I've been an Adventist is my focus has always been on righteousness by faith. It's only till I came in this movement that I really began to see and understand pro prophecy correctly. That is, I mean, obviously, I believe in the 2300 days I was interested in chronology and those types of things. But I was not trying to understand anything new about prophecy. Whatever the church had said, whatever Ellen White had taught, as far as what I understood, that's as far as I went. I definitely wasn't even going to think about what's coming next. Because my view as an Adventist is we don't know. You know, time's no longer. One day, you know, Jesus will come back. And if we focus on righteousness by faith, we will be ready. But you can see that we, we need to understand this history that precedes this because we're gonna we're in the time of the judgment. And if we're gonna stand in the judgment correctly, we need to have this experience of righteousness by faith, but we can't have it if we've rejected the first and the second steps. Right? So as, as Adventists, many people try to be righteous and they think they're righteous, right? I mean, they're not gonna say it but they're going to think it and, and they will think that, you know, those little things, because they'll talk about the little things, you know, not eating between meals and all this stuff taken out of context from the spirit of prophecy and think because they don't do some of those little things, they're righteous, but who else did the little things, but not the big things. The Pharisees. Right. So they tithe in mint, and cumin or whatever it is called, right? But they neglected the weightier matters of the law, you know, mercy, right? right? They had no mercy. They had nothing in the character of Christ. And that's because we don't realize what we have to, what we have to go through to stand in the judgment, right? 
Now, of course, we're going to see how this all works out in the repeat of history. But when we when we go into the repeat of history, I mean, we're going to take our time again. Now, I like to do these broad strokes, right? I like to give these overviews, but I, I tend to put too much detail in them, right? But the thing is, we're going to go over them again and again. And so this everlasting gospel is not just about external events. It's about how God is working in our lives and these external events, these things that have been happening in the world, the things that are happening in this movement, the things that are happening in the church, all of these things are experiences that we have to pass through. And it, it, it's a very difficult um, thing to do, right? To go through this work of being transformed from somebody who was in darkness who can stand in the presence of Christ. Because Jesus just signed, shined a little bit of light into our life, and we were almost completely undone. And, and it was just a little ray of light that reached us. And God keeps pouring light upon us, but these are still the light that he wants to show us compared to his eternal glory. What he has shown us is just a fraction of the light that exists. We barely understand Christ's character. Our, our minds, as we know, are not able to comprehend the depths and the riches of Christ's character. And so as we take up our cross, as we yoke up with Christ, and as we go through this experience of justification, sanctification, and of judgment, um, we have a deeper appreciation for God and a love for those around us. And we are then empowered to give a message. And Christ's character will be seen upon us. It's, it's, it's a miracle. It's not something that we could manufacture. And God has given us these steps, this line upon line. So we know we're analyzing them. We're writing them line upon line, precept upon precept, setting them in order. But we do that because God can speak to us through these lines. And, and these lines were misused by others, just as all truths are misused, because people were using them to justify themselves. People were believing that, you know, on such and such a date, I'm not going to be a sinner anymore. Right. So so this is this is where we're at in, in understanding these lines. This is where we're beginning. So. Uh, we're going to close with prayer. Any uh, final thoughts that are extremely important? Okay, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for how you teach us. And we know, Lord, that as we take our time with you each day, seeking your face, as we study and open your word, as we look at what is happening around us in the light of your word, as we examine our Christian experience in the light of the character of Christ, we know, Lord, that you will be able to, um, to transform us. We need you every moment, every hour. I pray that you can bless each person who watches these videos and that you can guide in our study as we continue over the next several months trying to understand these lines fully in as simple a way as we can, that we can know how to present them, but most importantly, that we can experience what it is you want us to experience. Be with each person. May your angels watch over us. And may you bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.